well, the title of the talk is social media platforms, trading with prediction error minimization for your attention. And <clears throat> for starting this talk, uh, it's important to know that the nature of human culture is to guarantee that specific well-bounded and highly bilateral states are frequented. So culture defines where individuals will deploy their attention, which is attentional practices, the affordances that are relevant and salient in a given moment. So cultural affordances acquisition by regimens of attention can be understood are, are, uh, as shared patterns of attention and shared expectations, which reduce metabolic cost to, re to minimize prediction error. So individuals' concerns have been shaped by learning in their sociocultural practices, determining what shows up as relevant in the field of affordances. So we have the landscape of affordances, um, which are all the available possibilities of action in a given environment. And we also have our field of affordances, which are the emerging possibilities of action that stand out as relevant or salient in a situated moment, which includes sociocultural practices. And in this field of affordances, we spend approximately 16 hours of one full walking, walking day. Um, and this field of affordances um, can be also understood as cultural affordances. Um, which are possibilities of actions that humans encounter in their niches. And these cultural affordances include natural and conventional affordances, which are in some way socially constructed. So natural affordances are reliable possibilities of action in a given moment. Conventional affordances are possibilities of action which depend on explicit or implicit expectations, norms, conventions, social practices in the individual's ability to infer the culturally specific sets of expectations. Importantly, here is the social aspect, the social affordances, which are possibilities of social interactions offered by the environment. Importantly, we, we respond strongly to emotional content related to social interactions. Our field of affordances is heavily populated by social cues that grab our attention. So nowadays, individuals are immersed in both an offline geographically situated culture and also in an online digital culture. So together, they determine the patterns of attention that will be learned. As all we know, COVID-19 pandemic brought deep global changes, pushing societies to an online digital way of life. And given the importance that digital world has taken in our lives, digital affordances, with, which are online possibilities of actions, have become an enormous part of our cultural landscape. So um, it seems relevant to ask how much daily time we spend online connected, how much daily time we spend on digital social platforms. So we can start um, by telling the world's population uh, right now, it's 7.8 billion um, people around the world. So in terms of internet use, it consists of 4.8 billion people around the world, which is 61% of the world's total population. And the daily time spent using, using internet is approximately six hours, 55 minutes. So returning to our field of affordances, we can see that now it's divided. Our time is divided in cultural affordances, which are offline and situated in the physical world, and digital affordances online in, and, and situated on a digital world. So um, in my point of view, this division, uh, um, the way we, we 
devour our field of affordances in the digital and in the physical world is becoming more and more relevant. So now in terms of social media use, there are 4.4 billion social user, social media users around the world, which is the 57% of the world's total population. And importantly, in the past 12 months, there are 520 million of new users, which is a 13% increase. So one out of nine total user, users started within the past 12 months. So more than 1.4 million new users join social media every day. That is 50 new users per second. Importantly, the question is how much daily time does a user spend using social media? And in this graph, we can see the daily time spent using social media by, by country, and in white, we can see the worldwide mean time spent using social media, which is two hours, 25 minutes. So now, Returning to our field of affordances, we can also divide this um, time spent in digital affordances, but now using um, digital social platforms or digital social affordances, which are online possibilities of social interaction specific to the attributes of a digital social platforms. And as you can see, um, if we spend, spend 2.3 hours a day, it, it is 16 hours per week. So we spend a full working day in social media platforms. So <clears throat> the main aim of this work is to analyze under the active inference framework how the field of relevant affordances is changing as a product of the use of social media platforms, specifically how digital, digital social affordances mediated by third parties are manipulating our patterns of attention, affecting the meaningful content that is acquired, the way self-identity is built, how beliefs are updated, as well as how social norms are learned. Special emphasis is made on the user's monitoring of prediction error dynamics, which is the rate at which prediction error is minimized over time during the engagement with digital social affordances in digital social platforms. So two questions are relevant here. Is the field of relevant affordances moving towards a biases anticipatory digital affordance responsiveness? Are digital social platforms changing our patterns of attention? So <clears throat> what are digital social platforms? Um, importantly, we have to understood, understand that we live in data five times, which are determining the design behind digital social affordances. So the main aim is to increase the daily time users spend on digital social platforms in order to keep them producing more and more data, because data is what generates value. The strategy behind is amplifying what attracts their attention, the attention of the users. So for doing so, this strategy uses learning algorithms, needing active participation of humans to generate relevant data for training. They learn to predict users' behavior and preferences to determine the information that is assigned to each user. They are tools that will find those patterns that will change the behavior of the users. <clears throat> so, in the free online culture model, users do not pay for using data services and neither are paid for the data they input to digital services. <clears throat> the goal behind is to produce data to generate more and more 
value. Digital social platforms are mediated by third parties with economical interests. And here we can see that 58% of digital share of total world, worldwide spend on advertising media <clears throat> is digital. And this, this corresponds to 378 billion dollars annually and importantly in a year the change the annual change uh, in worldwide spend in digital ad spend is um, a 13 percent increase so this is really valuable economical proposals and well, important to highlight that the problem is not the digital social platforms per se. The problem is the manipulation engine behind them. So digital affordances can be studied under active inference framework and also uh, focusing on the role of prediction aerodynamics. So how are our affordances or digital social affordances selected in a given moment. And here, embodied feelings are the key. They allow a sensitivity to how well or bad an agent is doing at improving its grip on what is relevant in the landscape of affordances. The, sensitiv the sensitivity, sensitivity to changes in the rate of prediction error reduction is known as prediction error dynamics. So the steeper the slope, the faster the rate of reduction. And prediction error dynamics are manifested as changes on affect. So if the rate of error reduction is faster than expected, a positive balance or a positive feeling is experienced, and the action policy is more precise as, as a result. And if the rate of error reduction is slower than expected or increasing unexpectedly, negative balance or negative feelings are experienced and, and, and the related action policy becomes less precise. So users encode in their cortical hierarchy the sets of expectations that correspond to preferred digital social platforms in order to selectively engage with those relevant social digital affordances. So responsiveness to relevant digital social affordances, which are solicitations, um, need possibilities for action, plus affected, affective attractiveness, plus individuals concerned shaped by their social cultural practices. And policy selection is determined in terms of how likely it, it will lead to expected outcomes, plus the expected rate of error reduction. And digital social platforms afford two, ca two, categories, two categories of actions. Digital social instrumental actions, which are intrinsically motivated behaviors directed towards preferred social outcomes, and digital social epistemic actions, intrinsically motivated explorative behaviors directed to maximize information gain and rewarding social experiences. So digital social platforms provide many, many different types of digital social affordances. And we analyze some common ones, placing them into two categories, self-identity formation and some relevant, some relevant affordances are profile making, editability, audience curating, information sharing, and metavoicing. Also, belief updating, um, the category of belief updating, which is um, some affordances are infinite scrolling, information search, cost surveillance, and notification checking. This division is based on the effect that error reduction and its expected rate has on users' beliefs about themselves and user beliefs about others and the world. So 
we are working on it. We are, we are making this, this table dividing um, digital affordances in terms of self-identity formation and belief updating and the digital action um, with they are related to. So they can be epistemic or instrumental and also the desired outcomes that the user is, is searching for. And also the design strategy behind each one of these affordances. So because of time's concerns, <laughs> um, I cannot um, explain um, each one of them, <clears throat> but um, all these digital social affordances become as highly silent in the field of digital affordances because they share a fast expected rate of prediction error reduction. So I want to explain two of them. The first one is appearance changing. Appearance changing affords to users to edit versions of oneself that seem positive. And digital epistemic actions are done to explore identity and self-appearance. And this exploration, um, of course, in, in a high, hyper speed, they are hyper speed comparisons. So we share expectations about how we should look. And when editing appearance for social approval, first, prediction error rapidly increases, but that but a fast rate of prediction error reduction is expected due to internalized social standards. This policy becomes highly relevant. Information gain about self-appearance and social approval is very important. And self-appearance prediction error can be minimized online and extremely fast. And so the offline self-image becomes uncomfortable. We cannot minimize our image in the mirror, but we can minimize prediction error by using AI filters with social cultural appearance standards. And this is the strategy behind this digital affordance, which is motivating information sharing. We can immediately change our own image by applying filters of desired sociocultural appearance standards. So this has been called snapshot dysmorphia because unrealistic sociocultural standards are provoking a maladapted internalization of social norms. And we share these pictures our, of ourselves with these filters that that um, are under this um, desired social cultural appearance standards. And <clears throat> the second affordance I want to explain is infinite scrolling. Infinite scrolling affords to users scrolling and scrolling their digital social platforms endless feeds. And Digital social epistemic, epistemic actions are not directly related to a specific anticipatory utility, but its salience pertains to please curiosity related behaviors. So users select salient information of their feeds, but this, is, this information is, is optimal for error reduction. And why is optimal? It's optimal because of the design strategy behind the engineer preferences of the, of that the algorithm has learned about the user, what the user is going to select, what, what is salient and relevant, and the error is optimal for its reduction. So infinite social, infinite scrolling, importantly, also allows a digital social instrumental action we ha which has as an outcome finding out relevant digital solicitation. So monitoring of prediction error dynamics 
and the associated feelings will increase the attunement with those digital affordances that stand out as relevant. So it is an instrumental action because we know that when we engage with infinite scrolling, we are going to find out relevant affordances to engage with. So <clears throat> optimal grip and digital social platforms. Optimal grip is experience as equilibrium. So this equilibrium is experienced as an affective tension. Adequate performance is enacted in the particular situation to reduce affective tension. So a nice example is to step back in an elevator to, 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 to feel this equilibrium again and reduce the affective tension. So affectivity can be understood as action readiness, playing a central role in structuring the field of affordances. Affectivity emerged in part as a reflection of error dynamics. So the field of affordances will also be structured in a way where we are able to stay in touch with our various cares and concerns. So there are three dimensions in the field of relevant affordances, the width, the depth and the height. The width is the broadness of the scope of affordances, choices or different actions, options. Depth, the temporal domain, the future possibilities for actions, anticipatory affordances, responsiveness. And the height is the relevance and the salience of the affordances. So here we can see a representation of the field of affordances. And these affordances have different width, depth, and height, and also they have a corresponding expected rate of prediction error. So affectivity as action readiness and the sensitivity of error dynamics is key. So if the environment changes and the individual's concerns change, the salience relevant affordances changes. So the height of digital social affordances can lead us to the question, are individuals becoming highly responsive to them? So in this representation of digital social affordances, we aim to highlight that the height is is important because they are very salient and their salient correspond to the affectivity as action readiness because the prediction error can be reduced in a very fast rate. So the richest opportunities for improving our grip come from affordances that are neither too complex or nor too simple. Affective dynamics keep agents in contact with those spaces that have optimal complexity. So in these same affective dynamics that are hijacked by addictive behaviors and substances also includes the hyper-stimulating effects of many digital social platforms. So, <clears throat> Digital patterns of attention learned in digital social platforms may be placing into risk a context-sensitive grip on a rich, dynamic, and varied field of relevant affordances. Embodied addiction is a similar story we, where pathological high precision on particular policies can create an imbalance and indeed a collapse in the field of affordances. Digital social platforms functions as a hyper affordance, exploding how attention is manipulated by culture as a tool to reduce metabolic costs, but for marketing purposes. So being sensible to prediction aerodynamics makes digital social platforms a technological tool highly attractive for users, and they are built taking advantage 
of our natural tendency to minimize prediction error in social contexts. The task of minimizing prediction error is easy in the digital existence, and it is felt as pleasant as it tends to be reduced in a, in a very fast rate. So the takeaway message is that digital social, social platforms are trading with prediction error minimization for our attention. Design, designing digital social affordances, which allow an easy and fast rate or prediction error reduction, will keep our attention to generate more data and more and more value. The field of digital social affordances is becoming more and more salient as attentional manipulation increases. Finally, we believe that in the digital way of life we are immersing, it is worth to debate and study further if and how the narrowing of the context-sensitive field of relevant affordances is occurring towards a biases anticipatory digital social affordances responsiveness mediated by third parties' interests. So, special thanks to my co-authors, Mahal Telbarasin, Mark Miller, and Bruna Lara, and to cognition organizers. And well, these are my <laughs> information. Um, if you want to contact me, it will be a pleasure. All right, thanks so much, Alejandra. It was a uh really really cool um anyone with questions please uh come to the q a i think i see already marco there we go go for it hey, yeah uh, actually uh, i think i have a question still but, but i just wanted to say that was great and i really believe that this is one of the most valuable applications for uh, active entrance for uh, the real world especially short and long term um and so uh one thing that I'm noticing is, is, is I think we need to accept that the, uh, the institutions, the, the industries behind these maladaptive manipulations of how our attention is being, attention and values are being um, acted upon. These, there's this weird problem of they're arriving at systematic methods without the systematic understanding, which is kind of interesting, right? So you get, you get the whole A-B testing and focus groups and everything, and they just do whatever works. And that's a scary part, right? They just do whatever works and, and, and that will continue until we have systematic understanding of why whatever works is also bad for us in the long term, right? There is literally no incentive for them to uh, make it in a long-term way uh, healthy or sustainable. And one thing I often like to say is that this is the modern day uh, uh, analogy, not analogy, uh, homology equivalent of uh, the industrial revolution, right? So, so the long-term consequences are just really, really complicated to understand. And the moment where we would see the, 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 the impact, the negative impact of these kinds of practices, if we wait until we see them, then it's going to be too late. So, so again, I'm just, um, you know, just saying this is really great and important. But so one thing that I find um, potentially of interest, and I'm not sure if you or your colleagues are already doing this, is, is um, so, so the way that they can systematically and effectively manipulate attention and valence for this, you know, the whole nasty loop of acting upon the people, um, are there like tropes, right? So, so patterns, um, like uh, schemes, right? So I think game theory might be a very, very interesting um, lens for that. Um, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I'm not sure if, if it makes sense, but this, are there like, you know, a, a way to create a framework of, of how these, uh, loopy ways of, of, of manipulating their users or consumers uh, will yeah. uh, uh, it is done because I, I, I don't even think that if you're going to do the whole the shady business in those companies, I don't think they will have a model. That's the scary part. You can't just go in and wait for a whistleblower or something. We, you actually have to deconstruct whatever they have found to be working. And so is that going to be possible you think, for you? Yeah. Um, thank you for all your comments, Marco. And it's it's very interesting what you were saying about gamification. Um, actually, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the, there's a hypothesis for me. It's, it's very interesting. This hypothesis that 
um, metabolizing, for example, the importance of metabolizing can be seen so what is that? I, I, as a game. Metabolizing is um, likes, likes or yeah, likes, oh. uh, retweets, uh, all the, the hearts in, in, in Twitter and, and like very tiny and with few types of communicating with others, giving feedback uh, so quickly. That's metabolizing. Okay. okay. And but what, what is important there? Um, there are metrics. We can see the metrics. How many likes, how many hearts, how many retweets or shares. And this is the game. This, this, the theory behind this gamification of communication. So users are internalizing metrics as an evaluation of, of how we communicate. So it's not what is not per se relevant is the content of what we are trying to communicate, but the numbers, the metrics behind. So um, prediction error, it, it's um, and the and the type of, of information we want to share, like behind or underneath it, it also with we are expecting metrics in the way we are communicating. So yeah. Um, uh, for me, it's a very relevant point there, Marco. Uh, the commu yeah. communication kind. And so, Mao, please. There's a there's another way that we could parametrize what their strategies are by simply looking at what kind of information pattern maximally reduces, um, you know, free energy and basically just uh, gives you a very very strong re reduction in uncertainty, right? So or or signals that you're going to have a reduction in uncertainty on any given kind of field. So for instance, a very known pattern is um, these two people are the ugliest in the world, uh, check out who, right? And so they're hinting at the fact that there is a very salient social information here and that there's a very simple way for you to disambiguate this information, which is socially salient. And this kind of pattern is is easy to parametrize, right? You could you can easily find um, create an agent which um, has an intentional process that is driven by the the prediction of reducing some uncertainty and does having a model that knows it's going to reduce its prediction error over time. Um, the problem with that model would be that if they used it, it becomes an arms race, right? We can identify what processes are most likely to lead to this, which means they could also identify them and potentially, you know, use it. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's what Mahal was, Mahal was, uh, uh, what that was about. But, but, but if, if I understand correctly, so I think that's what I also mean, what, why I think game theory is important. I'm not just saying gamification, but like the, the, the game that is played between the user and these technologies. So when, when, cause, cause the game, the implicit language game or the implicit game that is played is in itself a kind of belief, right? So when you reinforce that these are the modes of interacting, that these are the games that um, with which you interface with cyberspace or the world at large through cyberspace. And that in itself is the issue, because when that becomes precise, then there is very little means of escaping that, because your very interface with, with the world, um, how you relate to it, what your notion of what signifies significance, if that is already claimed by this, let's say, culture, um, then you can't really escape it. So, so I think that's what I, what, what I mean to say, and like Mahal will say, that, that becomes an arms race. And, the, and, and it's an arm race between not the user and these companies, but between the companies. And that's the scary part. So what should be the way that people and users can, in a weird way, also engage in the arm race, but not like, you know, doing it upon each other. But what is the way to de, de asymmetrize or re even the playing field, right? Um, I'm not sure if that's because I feel like this work is, is really good at, for now, at, at a problem diagnosis. And, you know, the ideal scenario would be to leverage that to get to solution uh, problem solving um, and how to design tools or new practices. And then, you know, I, I, to be honest, I, for now, I, I'm slightly pessimistic that I think the most valuable part is actually re, re appreciate and reemphasize the importance of lift practices. Um, and I think that also and I think the, the people's intuition that that is the case also 
um, is indicated by certain movements. I think someone mentioned John Ravaki, the meaning crisis. Um, the, 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 I think the pandemic has facilitated this whole community building movement as well. I think um, that is all in the meat space because I think that we have an historical foundation to ask this question. Um, I'm rambling a bit, but I'm just also curious about your thoughts about um, whether in the cyberspace itself, there's also a way to counter these movements. Uh, yeah. I, I, I totally understand your 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 point, Mark, Marco, and and I'm I'm not sure <laughs> what what could be like the the outcome of of what is happening right now. And there is no regulation. That's that's a big issue. There is no regulation, and and if regulation starts, um, then um, new ways of communications can emerge and. We are going to need new and new regulations, um, and it's. I it's, actually don't think regulation helps. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, so uh, my in my point of view, um, it's um, it's it's in it's in the individual level. So each one of us has to like. Uh, your <laughs> be aware of uh, of our field of relevant affordances how many time do we spend there so uh, what what i have done and, and this is in the personal domain i turned off all the notifications i'm 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 almost out of facebook really i'm 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 really doing it um it's difficult you know uh, that's a problem um, because these, these things are addictive, it's my point of view. But um, if I want to sh share something personal here, I'm I'm feeling better, you know, being out of, of, of social media. And um, I'm just using WhatsApp um, because of uh, COVID pandemic and this is, um, is my social interactions, but that's that's almost all. <laughs> so yeah. it, it, it's a personal decision. Um, and to be aware of these these uh, strategies behind of uh, the manipulation of attention, it's important. So being aware, so the responsibility is in the user. I I think this is where um, there Ali, Ali and I kind of disagree. Um, the problem yes, statement in itself, like I don't think per se the problem is that our attention is being focused. Because the reason it's being focused is that we're tuned to a hyper stimulus. The problem is that this tool is mostly only being used by one or two actors, which have a very specific intent in mind. And so while we could repurpose their tool for community building, for extension of knowledge, which we have to some extent, unfortunately, they have in mind to screw with our epistemic field to polarize us so completely that eventually we are unable to continue sharing and we're we're becoming limited to a very brittle um understanding of reality which is a problem in itself and then we don't have the tools to keep moving forward um so i think that's the issue we could effectively um turn ourselves into hive minds and maybe that's not a bad thing maybe the, the relevance of the field is only a function of what we intend to do with it. Um, so, you know, I, my answer is a bit different from Alejandra at this point. Mm, I, I guess I agree, I disagree with everyone. Um, and I, I, I fully encourage people to take first responsibility in protecting themselves from the maladaptive um, influences. But at the same time, I, I think we can't escape the fact that cyberspace is here to stay. Um, and, and, and I think, like, like Mo said, there, there's going to be, you know, opportunity for a lot of beneficial um, use cases. Um, but I think it's, it's impossible, almost impossible nowadays for most mortal souls to find a healthy balance in how to integrate it in your life. And I think that's, that's where we need to go, where it, I don't think it ever will be perfect, but that it will be uh, designed in such a way that it's feasible to develop your own particular relation to cyberspace. And just a very brief point, because finally there's a, uh, another person wanted to ask the question. So I also want to say that regulation is not, it's not the answer. And the reason why is because um, it, it's not uh, the scale at which regulation tends to occur won't suffice for a this fast paced um, industry uh, and B for uh, the level at which the maladaptive mechanisms occur is, is highly variable. 
and it's highly specific to the particular cyber uh, particular context, the user um, eco platform interaction. And so I, th I think what's crucial is is that the the, the platforms and ecosystem need to have the available mechanisms and signals to know when something is maladaptive. Then maybe hopefully Kevin is also going to talk about this. I, I hope so, given what he said before. But but that's again why I earlier also mentioned this whole thing about epistemic signals, right? This whole whole goddamn fucking industry is just pragmatic. It's just all reward driven. And even when something is ostensibly uh, epistemic. That it's it's still not you know it's not actually for the sake of understanding it just has this allure of that being epistemic so amount of shares and stuff right that is not actually because you want the user to know how popular or how good it is or how worthy of reading no it's a measure of how many people will view it so that you know how valuable ad space will be for that particular thing and so that's the thing I, I think you know given that this is an active inference group that's a crucial thing. What is epistemic should be epistemic, what's pragmatic should be pragmatic, and it should be in a healthy relation with each other. And anyways, I, I've been rambling too much, but again, great work, and I hope to see this uh, continue on further. And then, uh, go ahead, Kevin. Thank you so much, Matt. Excellent. Really um, Kevin is next. And this is, yeah. our, unfortunately, this is our very last question. Right, and maybe it's just like kind of a more provocative, right, kind of uh, foray into the space that, that it's already worse. Thanks to, to Marco and of course uh, Alejandro and Mel, but the uh, you know because the thing that, that I've been wondering about, right, just kind of a, as a personal yeah, side obsession is, well, the agents who are using right these kind of attention attracting technologies, right, to kind of advantage themselves, are actually like you know maybe, maybe there's a couple people who have like the, the maximum influence in the in the space, but also it's like it, it's two components, right? So it's, it's both the agents, it's also the niche they're embedded in. And what the niche is selecting for in terms of strategies, you know, and, it, and that is like I guess maybe uh, analog trying to draw the analogy of like, but yeah, given a certain environment and a terrain that's like incredibly hot, it's really helpful for species to uh, evolve and adapt to radiate heat as much as possible. It's very cold, right? They they adapt to uh, to retain heat as much as possible, and there is no like you know one size fits all. It kind of depends on the uh, the situation they're in. And, and I wrote a message uh, directed at Mal regarding the, the idea of relevance. I think she commented on. Uh, previously in the chat, um, where it's like, well, you know, I wonder if like it even makes sense. And I'm still in this idea from John Ricky, but of like, can you give it a national definition of what's relevant? Because you know, it's it's like, well, can you say what's fit? Well, no, it just depends on the nation, the context you're in. And so then maybe the question is, is what do you guys uh, suspect would be a better niche construction to facilitate? Uh, you know, whether it's Facebook or whether it's, you know, uh, different corporations using advertising techniques to, to kind of fracture or, or capture certain attention, uh, or really just the attention economy, right? It's driven by a certain kind of, uh, you know, and I, I don't really know, right, what what the, like, I also, I'm very always skeptical, like, is it just one problem or is it like a multitude of things kind of feeding back to each other and kind of feedback loops and reinforcing and kind of creating these emergent effects that no one agent is actually responsible for? And maybe they don't even want, which goes back to Marco's point about, like, they're optimizing the short term without the long term goal in mind, but like there's no incentive, right, to want to aim for that goal. Uh, and maybe that's analogous to like how, well, what incentive was there for like bodies to uh, figure out that, you know, we, there should be like an anti, uh, anti like, cancerous element if you don't see that effect until like, you know, 60, 70 years in one's lifespan and you've already effectively, you know, uh, reproduced offspring. Like, is there a reason for, for the, the niche to select for a strategy that's actually beneficial in the long term? Um, and I guess what would that look like? Sorry, that was a long question. Alejandro, do you want to start? But I expect you and I will have different answers. So I just, you go ahead. Go, go, go ahead. Bruno, or Bruno. Bruno, no one can hear you. Do you want to take my spot? Um, no, I can't. No one, yeah, no one in the, okay, just go to Alejandro's screen, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that just very quick. Um, the, the, the I think that one way to answer this is like um, the problems are the platforms here. So like the intents of the platforms that you are looking for. No, so it's it's very difficult to. Um, I mean because the things behind the algorithms behind they have another purpose. So they are not they they facilitate you something. But it's it's for me it's some sort of illusion. So 
because somebody was saying, yeah, it depends on the niche, but maybe that's exactly what they want you to think. I mean, that, that's what we call audience curating, no? in, in one of the affordances. So it's, it's, it, that's the illusion that you have, but because it's reinforcing something, no? But I don't know, I mean, maybe there will be some different platform that will allow different strategies and that doesn't have um, economical purposes behind. That's the whole point here, I think. I don't know. <laughs> Rolls away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go ahead now. Well, okay, so there are metrics that we can easily, I mean, we've measured them. I'm working on a project with Daphne Demakis and Connor Hines right now that's doing exactly that, that's measuring the kind of metrics which tell us what promotes an echo chamber. And as I was discussing earlier, echo chambers produce brittle epistemic fields. So what you want is an epistemic community which doesn't produce this brittle field. And my sense is that while we don't know what the goal would be, we, don't, we cannot tell right now what the best goal, the best goal state would be, there is a heuristic that seems to lead in goal states, which are generally seen right now, looking back as more positive. And I believe those are, to, uh, those are uh, more epistemically um, accurate and a better model, basically, just something that produces a better model. And you can measure that on, on, on social um, media platforms by simply seeing the interconnectivity of the network i.e. does it produce clusters which are two separate from one another and then produce their own spheres of knowledge which then are irreconcilable but also which socially um, seem to be irreconcilable like you literally do not assign any precision to someone from a group which seems to produce something which is different from yours so it's not just semantically irreconcilable it's socially irreconcilable so i believe that the answer to that is you as an individual have the power to reflect on the kinds of things you're being shown and understand that while it may trigger emotional responses which you do not want to be exposed to or that shows kinds of information which you think are so ridiculous they're not worth being seen you should probably make yourself see them just continue to keep that networking alive so that you um, you can promote a, a better epistemic field All right, in, the, in that uh, wonderful thought, no, um, I think, uh, well, we run out of time, so we need to um, wrap it up uh, right here. Uh